Here are your top 10 tips to excel at improvisation. Number one is you gotta get out of practicing your scales straight up and down. It's almost completely useless. All it's gonna do is strengthen your ability to play scales up and down. What doesn't sound like music? Scales up and down. So if you're just spending a bunch of time running scales up and down, it doesn't matter what type, you're really wasting a lot of time. Once you kind of basically have a pretty strong grasp on the scale, you want to start making music with it in a kind of constraints type of way, which I'll share with you in a second. This is one of the most important things that I can share with you because I've talked many, many guitar students and I always find that people who are struggling to get better at soloing are spending way too much time playing exercise in a verbatim way, meaning that they're just playing it in an exact same way and they're trying to perfect it, so to speak, and or just speed it up. This really just doesn't make you better at improv. The second most important tip that I can share is please, please, please stop noodling when you're practicing the guitar. So if you're just goofing off, it, that's really not going to give you much kind of forward momentum in your guitar playing. Now, it is important to play the guitar and have some fun with it. I absolutely 100% agree with that. And I'm a big fan of like taking time in every practice session every day and kind of having some fun just playing. But if that is your main mode of practicing improvisation, it's just not going to work for you. Trust me, a lot of my students have done it. I did it. It just doesn't work. Noodling is a four letter word as far as I'm concerned and stay far away from it. Tip number three, my absolute favorite way to practice improvisation is using constraints with backing tracks. Constraints can take a lot of different forms, but one of the things that I like to do is I like to kind of turn on a track. In this case, I'm using an A minor track today, and I'm gonna use my A diagonal minor pentatonic. You can check it out in my solo on guitar, uh, the improvisers toolkit. And um, a lot of times what I like to do is start with just rhythmic constraints. So for example, Here's just a basic A minor track. The beat is like this, one, two, three, four. Okay, so a rhythmic constraint would maybe be, let me force myself to only play quarter notes, okay? How about eighth notes? Triplets. Now, when, when I do this in the practice room, it might end up sounding a little bit stale, but what it's doing is it's strengthening your rhythm. Okay, that's a great way to play. Um, another great one would be uh, using different note groups. Um, so maybe I force myself to, instead of playing like a note groups practice, like a three note groups practice, like... That's a very verbatim pattern. Now, is it a good one? Absolutely. But if you practice playing that up and down, that's not going to really translate to music. But if you practice forcing yourself to use that, let's see if we can make that sound good. So I'm mixing them up. So I, I might play a few of the three note groups. And I would target that little idea just a bit inside of my solo practice and that would strengthen it when I went to use that. But it wouldn't be like... If you play that over and over and kind of up the entire scale, it really doesn't sound that musical. All right. Um, so another cool thing is like working in a certain position that you're uncomfortable with. Like say you learned a new scale shape, um, one of the cage system shapes or a diagonal pentatonic or another pentatonic shape or something like that. Or say uh, you're trying to just solo uh, better on one string. That's a great thing to do. So that's a positional constraint. So I'm playing A minor pentatonic on one string. Okay, so that's on the E string. Let me see if I can go to the B. So 
So things that are challenging me is like forcing myself into like places that I'm not as good at, right? Okay, another great one to do is uh, technical constraints. So like, let me take a solo and try only play hammer-ons. Again, this is in the practice room. You wouldn't necessarily ever do this on a gig or performance. Hammer-ons only. I can try and use slower ones. Fast ones. Or maybe I'll work on pull-offs. Slides. It's amazing it gets you out of your comfort zone. Those uh, pull-offs, hammer-ons, slides, bends, vibrato, those are the things that make just regular old scales and notes sound really awesome. Okay, tip number four. Don't spend all of your improv practice time playing at the same tempo, right? So if you're like going out and you're playing with friends or like you're going to somebody's house or you're going to play in some kind of context, you're not going to spend 20 minutes on the same tempo. I mean, if you're in a jam band, it could happen. But like realistically, if you spend too much time on one tempo, you're not going to get that diverse kind of tempo. So use a program like uh, Ableton Logic Pro Tools or there's some online uh, loopers and things that you can speed up and slow down the track. So I'm using Transcribe and I can just take the track and uh, I can make it faster, like say 125%. Whoa, now all of a sudden I'm working in a different way. I do this a lot where I'll work on different rhythms, like say I try to um, push my tempo with the uh, 16th notes. triplets you can really push yourself in a very fun way tip number five very similar don't spend all your time in one key so a lot of these programs what you can do is even if you're using the same track which i highly recommend using different tracks but even if you were using the same track you can transpose these so say i want to bring this down uh, two half steps or a whole step to G minor. Still sounds really good. I put it back at 100%. Right, so I force myself uh, to play in different keys, uncomfortable keys, places that I, you know, uh, maybe don't always play. I want to be able to go to a jam session or a, or a recording session or a practice with my band or whatever and feel comfortable jamming in any key with anybody. And the way you do that is you kind of throw yourself under the bus in the practice room. Tip number six, listen to the great masters and copy them. Okay, so I think it's really important to like find your favorite licks. Maybe you're just listening to your Spotify or your iTunes or like whatever it might be. And when something strikes you and you like kind of perk up, you really want to spend time discovering like what is that. And what I oftentimes tell people to do is uh, to like go ahead and say, oh, what is that song? And at what what marking point is it? Oh, three minutes and fifty six seconds. I heard this amazing thing that Albert King did, or Stevie Ray Vaughan did, or BB King, or like Derek Trucks, whoever your favorites are and that thing pops out to you and you say "Ooh, I gotta remember that and then what I would recommend is going ahead and like recording that or just isolating that one little lick so you can focus on that nugget and that translates into creating a greatness library so this is something that I learned from decoding greatness and what I try to do is when one of those things just stick out to me whether it's a video or audio or whatever I try to document it and take it and put it in a folder, either on my computer, on my phone, or even better, you can put it on the internet in like a storage kind of place where you can access it all the time. And you'll be amazed at if you kind of like keep listening to those little nuggets, those things that really um, inspired you and you learn them on the guitar and you figure them out and everything, or you just listen to it over and over, it will improve your playing so much because you'll start to associate great playing with these pieces that you have in your library and you can just go to them at any time and check them out and it's really cool tip number seven practice active listening so if you have a great piece of music that you really like and you want to kind of know what's going on 
I highly recommend using active listening to learn it. And so what you'll do is you'll say, take one time through the song and you'll listen to only the drums, one time through to the bass, one time through to like the keyboards, or maybe it's the rhythm guitar. And then one time through to the lead guitar or the vocals or whatever. And you kind of take and you isolate and you try and only listen to that part. Then you come back and you say, oh, let me see how the bass and the drums are interacting. All of a sudden you'll be blown away at how much more actively you're listening and how beneficial that is to see what's really going on in the band and understand how all the instruments are kind of coexisting and making everyone sound better. Tip number eight kind of simplify the number of scale shapes and things that you are learning. I would say go ahead and commit to just a few. So I think that the cage system shapes are perfectly fine. You've got the seven note scales and then you have the pentatonic versions of those. I also really love the diagonal because it connects all the boxes and it kind of like can connect across the guitar neck. It's also very easy to understand. So I would say don't try and learn like a bunch of different systems. You don't need that many systems really like five major scale shapes across the neck. That'll give you all the access to all the modes. That's really everything you need. And it's better to spend time really digging into what's going on in each of the shapes, like what the intervals are, like the numbers of the scale and all that. That's going to be way more beneficial, uh, extensively more beneficial than if you just keep learning a bunch of different shapes. So number nine, springboarding off of learning the different shapes. I highly recommend that every day you spend a little bit of time learning the notes on the guitar neck. So it's really important to first start with the natural notes. Don't try and memorize the the fretboard by the chromatic scale. It just doesn't work. It doesn't make any sense. So just use the natural notes, which are the key of C major. And my recommendation is to play them from open to 12 on every string and you sing them or say them. So like E, F, G, A, B, C, D, E, E, D, C, B, A, G, F, E. I usually play a C chord in between each because the natural notes are the C major scale. Once that gets a little bit easier, as I have written in this uh, document here, you start doing what I call jumping thirds. E, G, F, A, G, B, A, C, B, D, C, E, D, F, E, G. As you start to do this, you might as well go as high as you can on the fretboard. F, A, G, B, A, C, B, D. And then what goes up must come down, always descend. Uh, D, B, C, A, B, G, A, F, G, E, F, D, sorry. Uh, e, C, D, B, C, A, B, G, A, F, G, E. And it's incredibly important to do that because the more and the better you know the fretboard, the more you can connect all these ideas together. So the licks you're learning from the great masters, you're translating them into, oh, he's playing out of this box or she's playing out of this arpeggio. And it kind of puts it all together. It's really incredibly important. I highly recommend that you work on your fretboard knowledge every day. Once you start uh, getting really good at the notes that are all natural, the C major scale, start working on the different keys that have sharps and flats. So basically uh, written here, uh, the key of G major has one sharp, mm. D major has two sharps, A major has three, E major has four, B major has five, F sharp major has six, and C sharp major has seven. Uh, and then you want to learn the flat keys as well. F major has one flat, B flat has two, um, E flat has three, A flat has four, D flat has five, G flat has six, and uh, C flat has seven flats. So work on all of those. And forget those people that say B sharp, E sharp, C flat and F flat don't exist. That's silly, that's not true at all. So the 10th tip and incredibly important, I highly recommend you create a practice log. And what you're gonna do with that practice log is before you ever get to the practice room, you're gonna go ahead and plan out what you're gonna work on. My recommendation is you work on things in small little chunks. I have a paper that I wrote, a thesis paper from my grad school called Deliberate Practice, The Pathway to Mastery. I will link it here. Um, I highly recommend you check that out. It has some ideas on the best way to practice. But one of the biggest things that science is saying now is that smaller chunks are better. So if you practice for a 15 minute segment and you work on five different things for three minutes each, that's way better than working on one thing for 15 minutes. So do your chunks, take a little break, come back. Maybe you cycle through those same chunks and again, maybe you do them out of order, but you gotta mix it up and it's really important to not uh, just play things over and over. So mindless repetition is the enemy in the practice room. I understand that that's the way that a lot of people prescribe how to practice. Just don't do it. All the science that's like newer science says that that is a waste of your time. 
So in your practice journal, I challenge you to do things that are tough for you. You should practice things that are easy for yourself, and you should have time to just have fun in your practice session as well, but the majority of your time should be spent on practicing things that you can't do very well. You slow them down, you work on them in a smart way, you break them down into small chunks, and you try and master them that way. And breaking them down into those small chunks, that's going to get you there a lot more quickly. All right, I hope that this was helpful, and uh, I know that if you apply these ideas to your improvisation and to your practice, you're, uh, only the sky is the limit for your playing. So I wish you the best. As with any of my lessons, you can leave a comment below, or you can feel free to reach out via email, danielseraphmusic at gmail.com. Thanks so much, and I'll see you soon.